Good afternoon all. We're going to transition to the part of the course where we're going to talk about energy. This particular week we're going to talk about some of the basics of energy. We'll get some definitions under our belt, understand some of the concepts related to energy, and then over the next couple of weeks we'll move into areas of renewable type of energy such as nuclear being one, geothermal, uh, we will cover several weeks of this type of energy. But let's start with the basics. So what we're going to do for today is we'll do an outlook for energy, some of the basics related to energy, some of the basic concepts that you will need to know. We'll talk about energy efficiency. Uh, before we get to that, though, of course, we'll have to define what we mean by energy. We'll also look at sources of energy and how energy is consumed. We'll talk about energy conservation, ways that we can increase energy efficiency, and a concept called cogeneration, which ties into increased efficiency and energy conservation. But cogeneration is an interesting area that since the mid-90s has been used to generate energy. We'll also talk about sustainable energy, the policies related to that. Uh, keep in mind throughout this entire course one of the underlying themes has been sustainability. So the outlook for energy. You probably have an idea about that. Um, back in the 1970s, the outlook for energy or energy production uh, was not, not good. Uh, most of our energy was derived from products such as fossil fuels that were imported from outside of the U.S. And some of the nations, uh, the OPEC uh, producing nations are actually OPEC which was an organization of Middle Eastern states that actually controlled the flow of oil into the US in other words how much we could import and there was what we called an oil embargo back in the 1970s that began right around 1973 and ran up through the early 80s so our the people that actually produce, the nations that actually produce the fossil fuels such as oil and gas, uh, cut back on what they were sending to the U.S. And so that really generated a lot of the conservation movements of the 1970s. Probably most of you listening to this particular um, video lecture do not remember that, but your parents do. You should ask them about that. Okay, so energy for today and tomorrow and beyond, there are a lot of questions related to that. Uh, there are no easy answers. The use of fossil fuels, here's the, here are some of the benefits of using fossil fuels. And I guess I should identify what a fossil fuel is for those that may not know what it is. But it's basically oil and gas that was derived by uh, the decaying of plants and animals and compressed deep into the earth, which ended up producing deposits of oil and natural gas, which we'll talk about later on in this particular lecture. But fossil fuels has really made life really nice for us. It's improved sanitation, medicine, uh, agriculture, um, so those are the positives, a few of the positives. There are trade-offs with using fossil fuels such as uh, natural gas and oil. And it has to do with cost to the environment. Not only dollar cost, but environmental costs to, that's related to drilling of oil has taken its toll on the environment. Using fossil fuels, as we know, helps to create pollution, which is concentrated in the urban areas. And now, and I shouldn't say now, but for the last 30 to 40 years, there has been discussion that the 
waste or the byproducts of fossil fuel use, such as CO2 being one of those, is changing our global climate. And in fact, the last two weeks of this course, we'll talk about global climate change. We'll get into that a little bit later. In this particular chapter, we'll just touch on it very briefly. So the future for, of energy is filled with uncertainty, and current and past policies will need to be reviewed and re-reviewed. Now, in terms of the continued outlook for energy, can the U.S. achieve energy independence? And what I mean by that, can we produce enough energy with our resources, one being fossil fuels, that we no longer have to import oil from OPEC nations over in the Middle East. And if we can end up achieving energy independence, how do we do this? So if you look at what the International Energy Agency put out, they said that peak oil production occurred about 10 years ago, about a decade. And what do we mean by peak oil? Basically, that means one half of the available conventional oil resource, defined as relatively light oil, has already now been used, which means we only have left, uh, only half of it left. Now, that's with the conventional oil resources. Um, this would seem to indicate an issue with oil supply, but that's not quite that's not quite true, and we'll see why here in just a moment. So the difference between production and demand in oil is being filled by new sources of oil and natural gas in the U.S. And you may have heard about some of this. Some of this has to as um, is due in part to shale rock, which is a sedimentary rock that we find in various portions of the U.S. and over in Eastern Europe. Did you know that they can actually pull chemicals out of that shale rock and through the process of chemical, um, chemical change can actually produce oil out of that? Now, if you look, and I'll come back to this slide in a moment, but you look at this particular map of the U.S., you see large areas of shale or oil or gas resources. Uh, the nearest one up to us is up in North Dakota, but you see parts of the Intermountain West here indicated in black, down in the Mid-South in Texas, over in the uh, Ohio Valley, large areas or large reservoirs of shale rock that we can go and pull oil or actually produce oil out of these shale rocks. Now the problem with that as you would guess, it's going to cost more because we're going to have to introduce different processes to actually produce oil out of this shale rock. And so that's going to lead to greater cost. Um, it also can make quite, about, quite, quite a bit of a negative impact on the environment. You've heard the term fracking. It's a process of drilling down into the earth. And in fact, there's been a lot of fracking done down here uh, through Oklahoma and portions of Texas. And what they have noticed over the last few years, they have noticed earthquakes. Now we're not talking about major earthquakes, but an increased frequency of what we would call light earthquakes, somewhere on the magnitude of three to four on the Richter scale down in this area. And it's because of the removal of the shale rock that is creating these empty pockets underground and the ground is shifting which is causing quakes to occur and so environmentalists are really upset about this that it's not only damaging the environment the physical the aesthetic look of the environment but it's also creating uh, major issues in terms of these quakes that we're beginning to see so when we're talking about environmentalists, and that's not a bad word, you know, some people use environmentalist as a, as a negative connotation, 
but environmentalists want to look at a sustainable energy policy, something that will last uh, indefinitely, in other words, can endure for generations, and will not harm the environment. Keep in mind, in this previous slide here, that the peak oil, in other words, the uh, conventional oil resources, we've already used up half of what they believe is available a decade ago. So we're on the downslope there. So looking for uh, different types of energy that are sustainable is a good way to move. So what we're doing in terms of the U.S. energy policy, now again we're totally talking about the United States, is we want to promote both the sustainable energy and energy independence. And we'll talk about how that may occur. But before we do that, we need to talk about, we need to look at some definitions uh, related to energy. The first thing that I'll introduce to you is called force. Okay, And we exert force by pushing or pulling on objects. Now, when you think about air pressure, you know, you hear atmospheric pressure. You watch the evening weather for, uh, weather shows or the newscast, and they talk about atmospheric pressure of 30 millibars. Well, atmospheric pressure is defined by a force exerted over a unit area. So if you think about all of the air molecules that are above your head and going up into the atmosphere, each of those molecules have a weight. And those molecules, even though you can't necessarily feel it, you can't see it, it is exerting a force on your head. When you go upstairs, when you climb up stairwells, you are exerting a force against gravity. Gravity is wanting to pull you down, but you exert a force against gravity by using your legs to climb up the stairs. So a force is anything by pushing or pulling you see in this particular slide here. This uh, person is pushing a car uphill, and so this person is exerting a force pushing on the car up a hill, and it's exerting a force against gravity. Now when we talk about the strength of a force, we measure it by how quickly or how much it accelerates an object. And like I said, we've got this example here. And we'll come back to this in just a few minutes, but again, the force that's being exerted against the car and against gravity is the force being uh, exerted by the person in the picture. Now another term that we need to look at is called work. And work is simply a force times distance. So if we go back here, this person is exerting a force against gravity <coughs> over a distance. So this person is moving the car up the hill, so it's traversing a distance, and the person is providing the force. So the person here is doing work against gravity and against the car. Now let me ask you this. Let's say, for instance, the person is pushing the car, but the car is not moving. Do we have work going on? Now if we say that work is defined as force times a distance, the person is exerting a force, but the distance being traversed by the car, if it's stationary, is zero. So anything times zero is equal to zero. So no work is being done. Work only happens when a force is being applied and the object that the force is being exerted on moves a distance. Now that can be east-west, north-south, up or down, so any type of distance. Now finally, we get to the definition on energy. 
And energy is simply the ability to do work. So to do work on this car, in other words, to apply a force and move this car over a distance, we need energy to do that. So where do you think the source of that energy is? Well, in this case, there is chemical energy, energy within the body, within the body. You know, you talk about calories, you take in calories, that stored energy, that energy is being transferred through the muscles and being pushed to the car. So the force being used is being used to push this car. And so once work is occurring, a force applied times the distance, we call that energy. And energy is the ability to do that work. Now when the car is up on top of the hill, we say that the energy has what we call potential energy. Now there are two types of energy that I would like to explicitly address here. One called potential energy and the other called kinetic energy. Now you probably remember some of this from your eighth grade earth science or maybe you took a science course in college and we simply define work, I'm sorry, potential energy is equal to the mass of an object times gravity times the height of the object above a reference point. So potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times height, mgh. So you'll hear me refer to that. So when we look back at this particular um, example here, let's say the reference point for the height is down here at the bottom of the hill. So there is a distance from the base of the hill up to where the car is that has a certain height. The car has uh, mass and there's the effect of gravity that the uh, that gravity has on the car. Now when we get it up here to the top, okay, when we get it up here to the top, the potential energy is at its maximum. So here, and I won't talk, there's two types of energy occurring with the car here. One is potential, the other is called kinetic. I'll talk about kinetic in just a moment. But the type of energy here called potential energy at the top of the hill is at a maximum compared to the potential energy here going up the hill and potential energy going down the hill. Now why is that? Well, let's go back to our formula here. Potential energy is mass. The mass of the car doesn't change from here to here. It's still the same. Gravity is constant. That doesn't change. So that just leaves height as the variable in this equation. And so if we look back here, when the car was being pushed up the hill, the reference height is the distance from the ground down here at the bottom of the hill up to this point. And if we look at the height here from this reference point at the bottom of the hill up to the top, the distance or the height is greater here than it is here. So the car at this point at the top of the hill has its maximum amount of potential energy. Okay. Now, when the car is over here being pushed up the hill and when the car is uh, going down the hill, it has an additional source of energy. And that source of energy is called kinetic energy. Energy of motion. And we define that as one half times the mass of an object times the velocity squared. OK, 
Okay. So kinetic energy is energy in mo motion, velocity, okay, is motion, and then the mass. So kinetic energy, when the car is going up the hill, has motion because we are pushing it up the hill. So it has a velocity, obviously not very fast. Uh, when we talk about velocity, we talk about it being in uh, meters per second squared. Okay. When it gets up here, uh, it has no velocity. It's just sitting there. So here the car has some potential energy because it's above a reference height, and it also has some kinetic energy. Once it gets here and it stops, its velocity goes to zero, Okay, so velocity goes to zero, and so anything multiplied by zero gives us zero. So we have a transfer of energy. As we go up the hill, we have some potential energy, some kinetic energy. We get to the top of the hill, we have potential energy. In fact, the maximum amount of potential energy at the top of the hill, but no kinetic energy. Once the car begins moving again, down here, as it's going down the hill, it now is giving up some of its potential energy because the reference height from the car to the bottom of the hill is now smaller, so potential energy is decreasing. Velocity is now increasing, so kinetic energy is increasing. So you see here, so when the car is going down the hill, the mass doesn't change, however the velocity increases, and so then we begin to see the kinetic energy increasing, potential energy, the reference height from the bottom to the actual uh, location of the car is decreasing, so potential energy decreases, kinetic energy increases. Now, there's this famous saying that energy cannot be created or destroyed. That is true, okay? But energy can change. And so in this particular case, as the car is going down the hill, its potential energy is decreasing, but its kinetic energy is increasing. And then when we get to the bottom of the hill, its potential energy is at its lowest because the reference height here, H, is lower and the car is moving. So again, the potential energy is at its lowest at the bottom of the hill. Now, I realize explaining this seems a bit cumbersome, but it's important that you understand that, especially the concept of energy changing. We'll talk more about that. We're not creating and we're not destroying energy. It's just that energy is changing. We talk about phase changes. We won't get into that too much. But um, basically what we're talking about is energy is being exchanged. Okay, let's see. So. When we say that total energy is conserved, the energy here is potential and kinetic. Here it's just potential. Here it's potential and kinetic. And down here it's mainly kinetic. So energy is being exchanged, but it's not being, uh, it's not being increased or decreased. The total, it's being conserved. So the total energy is still the same. It's just being rearranged between potential and chemical. We call this the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. An example that your textbook gives on the conservation of energy is with this tire swing. And these are the different positions of the tire swing. So position two, the tire swing is hanging from the tree and it's not moving. It's down at the, the lowest part. In this particular case, our reference height is the grass. Okay, How high the tire is above the grass. So in case one here, it talks about energy is all potential. So we're pulling the tire back. We're holding it. It's not being released yet, so there's no velocity. So the kinetic energy is zero. However, the object has potential energy because it has a mass of the tire, gravity, and the height of the tire above the reference surface. Notice the height of the tire is higher here 
than it is here at position number two. Now what happens when we release the tire as we go from one to three? Well once the tire begins to move it begins to have kinetic energy. Remember the formula one half the mass of the tire times the square of the velocity. So as soon as the tire begins to move it begins to have potential energy since the tire is getting lower to the ground the reference height is decreasing and so therefore what ends up happening is that potential energy begins to decrease we get to the base of the tire the tires moving now now the tire is at, is at the lowest spot here so it has little to no potential it's mainly kinetic energy as it begins to move up to position three here it's increasing the height above the ground and so now we have some potential, some kinetic, uh, kinetic energy, and by the time we get it up to one, it can only go a certain height, it stops just for a moment, okay, it stops for just for a moment. At that moment, at that instantaneous moment, now we have all potential energy, but then the tire begins to move back down again, moves down to position three. We have potential and kinetic it and then we get down to position two we, and at that instant instantaneous moment now it's all kinetic and it begins to oscillate back and forth but what happens if you do not apply a force an additional force to the tire it oscillates back and forth and then it begins to slow down and eventually it comes to position two it stops why is that give you a moment to think about that. Well it has to do with another force and that force you know can you think of what that force would be called? It starts with an F. It ends with an N. It's called friction. There is friction at the top of this rope and the tree to which it's attached. So this rope is tied to this tree branch, but as it moves, there is friction. Friction is acting against the motion. It's wanting to slow it down. Now we have transfer of energy. It goes from uh, all potential in position one to potential in kinetic position three, position two, all kinetic, position three as it swings up is potential and kinetic. It reaches the top here at position one and at that instant moment instantaneous moment it is now all kinetic but there's also transfer of energy here produced by friction and what ends up happening the friction begins to dissipate some of the energy or actually it doesn't dissipate the energy it changes the energy into what we call heat energy and so now we've introduced another type of energy caused by friction which we call heat energy. This heat right near where the branch and the rope are tied is giving off heat energy to the atmosphere. And so the friction is acting to dissipate the force that originally acted upon this tire until all of that energy, all of that potential and all of that kinetic energy is converted to heat energy. Again, we haven't created energy, we haven't destroyed it, we've just changed it from uh, potential and kinetic now to all heat energy. Once that happens, the swing stops. Now, we've talked about, we've defined what energy is, we've talked about work, now we need to talk about energy quality. You know, not all energy, uh, not all energy is of high quality and we'll learn about that. So we talked about um, work and we said the ability, the ability of energy is to do work. So if we look at higher quality of energy, that energy is more easily converted to work. If we have lower quality energy, then it's more difficult to convert this energy to work. And this leads to the second law of thermodynamics. So we talked about the first law. 
That's the conservation of energy. We can't create or destroy it. But the second law of uh, thermodynamics tells us that basically energy goes from a more usable, a higher quality form, to a less usable, lower quality form. When you use energy, you end up lowering its quality. So we go back up here to the swing. Potential and kinetic energy is working really well here initially, but friction caused by the rope tied to the tree, that energy is being dissipated, given off as heat energy caused um, by the friction here. And so this heat energy is what we would call a lower form of energy. In other words, it's not moving the tire here again. Even if we were to take this heat energy and put it back into the rope, it's not going to get this uh, tire swing moving again because it's now a lower grade of energy. And we'll talk about why that's important a little bit later on here. Okay, continuing with our discussion on energy efficiency, there are two types of energy efficiencies that your textbook talks about derived from the first and second law of thermodynamics. The first law of efficiency comes from the conservation of energy. And then we have the second law of efficiency, which we just uh, discussed just a moment ago, the second law of thermodynamics. And the difference between the first law efficiency and the second law of efficiency, when we look at first law efficiency, we're talking about the amount of energy without any consideration of the quality or availability of the energy. Okay, we talked about um, high value, high quality energy, which was potential and kinetic operating here on the, uh, on the tire swing. And then the lower quality uh, energy, which was the heat energy given off uh, from the tree and the rope caused by friction. And so when we talk about first law efficiency, we're talking about the amount of energy, whether it's high grade or low grade, um, so we don't consider the quality of it or the availability of it. So the first law efficiency, as we'll see in an example here shortly, is not the best indicator of energy efficiency. It's going to be the second law efficiency. And this talks about how well matched the energy end use, the energy end use, what we're using it for, is with the quality of the energy source. Now, I love the example that um, your textbook gives here. It talks about lighting a candle. We can light a candle uh, with a match, and we can also light a candle with uh, a blowtorch. Now, which one are you going to... If you're looking about... If you're thinking about energy efficiency, intuitively, you would want to use the match. Because the match matches, uh, that's a poor choice here, <laughs> the match matches, but the match itself is tied in more closely with the energy use and with the quality of the energy source. When we're talking about a match, we're talking about chemical energy. If we have low values of second law efficiency, this is an indication that we can improve the energy technology. In other words, we can improve the energy efficiency that would save significant amounts of high quality energy. When we're using a blowtorch to light um, a candle, that is a waste of energy because we don't need that uh, high of amount to light a candle. Now your table here, 14.1, gives examples of first and second law efficiencies. So you see here, the end use uh, in the first column has to do with an incandescent light bulb, fluorescent light bulb, cars, automobiles, power plants, uh, fossil fuels, water heating, etc. Now if we talk about first law efficiency, and let's go back to first law efficiency, this is the amount of energy without any consideration of the quality, whether it's low grade or high grade, or the availability of the energy. So the first law efficiency is not a great indicator for us. But it says here that a candle 
an incandescent light bulb has about a 5% efficiency factor. 95% of that energy is given off as heat or wasted heat. So very little of it is being used. Whatever that energy is, is being actually used to light the room you're in. It's just a very low efficiency. If we look at fluorescent light, you see the efficiency gets a little bit better, but still there's a tremendous amount of waste, a waste of energy on the order of 80%. Automobiles, you see the same thing there as the fluorescent light. Power plants, uh, if we look at the first law efficiency, it operates on about 30 to 40% efficiency with, again, 60 to 70% of waste. I hope by now you're beginning to get an idea that the energy that we're using is inefficient. We're losing a lot of it to wasted heat. Now, I'm not going to go through the rest of these, but let's look at second law efficiency. Now, second law efficiency, again, how well matched the energy is to the quality of the energy source. This is more of a true measure of the efficiency in, uh, related to energy. Now, if we look at automobiles, automobiles in terms of energy efficiency, it's only about 10%. So there is still room here to increase the efficiency. If we look at power plants, notice the second law efficiency is 30%. Matches up quite well with the first law efficiency. So what this tells me is that the quality and quantity of what the power plants are using there's not a lot of difference between the first law and the second law efficiency. But again, only 30% efficient. If we look down here at all energy across the U.S., if we look at first law efficiency, uh, that's 50%. But the true measure of it is about 10 to 15%. So we have the potential to increase energy efficiency quite high because we're still on the order of about 85 to 90 percent inefficient or being used for wasted heat. So there's definitely room for improvement. Now like I mentioned back here the power plants uh, they have nearly the same first law and second law efficiencies and when we look at that we can look at it in terms of what we call heat engines. The plants themselves actually represent what we call a heat engine. And what we mean by that, it produces work from heat. And most electricity generated in the world comes from heat engines, such as nuclear fuel, coal, gas, or other types of fuel. Okay, so now we're going to go into the area of heat engines. So we'll go through this a little bit. But let's continue a little bit talking about, this time, energy sources and consumption. So what are our sources and uh, what, is, what is the consumption of these sources of energy? In industrialized uh, portions of the world, the industrialized portions of the world make up a small percentage of the total population. However, that small population uses, they are large users of total energy produced. Okay, think about that. Small percentage of the total population exists in industrialized countries or in nations. However, the U.S. being one example is a large user of total energy produced. The U.S. in this example or in this particular slide shows that the U.S. is only made up of 5% of the world's total population. However, we use almost a quarter of the total energy consumed. Uh, that's a little little frightening there. What that tells me is that we've got room for improvement in how we use energy. So a very small part of the world population using a fourth or a quarter of the total energy consumed. Well, we've talked about fossil fuels a little bit. Let's talk about alternative energy sources. You've heard about that, but However, 90% of the energy consumed is from fossil fuels here in the U.S. 
and those fossil fuels are oil, natural gas, and coal. And these resource, these sources, these sources of fossil fuels are non-renewable. They were created by dead, uh, de decaying plant, dead animals. Um, you know, we talk about dinosaurs roaming the earth. Uh, when once they were compressed into the earth, they died. They compressed. They ended up uh, producing oil. But unless we uh, create uh, basically, we, we cannot create oil, natural gas, and coal. It is a non-renewable resource. Once we're out of that, that's it. And you saw in the simulation that you did with a recent lab where we looked at, um, back in the biogeochemical cycles, as you recall, we talked about running out of coal and oil within the next 100 years as you ran the simulations. You basically ran out of greenhouse gas or ran out of uh, fossil fuels. However, there are alternative energy sources: geothermal, being earth; thermal, being energy, so energy produced by the earth; nuclear energy uh, produced by atoms; hydropower, water power. We have a lot of dams across the U.S. that help to produce power. And then, of course, solar energy, which became really popular back in the 70s. And these are renewable energy resources. I mean, as long as the sun continues to exist, it is a, an energy source that is um, infinite. That is, until it eventually uh, supernovas. But assuming that's many, many millions of years into the future, that is a resource that we have. And also wind. Uh, anytime you have a temperature difference, pressure differences, you will have wind. And so we're not going to deplete those. So that's what we call renewable energy sources. Alternative energy resources we have, we've identified as geothermal. Geothermal energy, and we'll talk about that uh, in a later lecture within the next couple of weeks. But geothermal is a very popular alternative energy out in the desert southwest. Uh, we do have nuclear power plants uh, in the U.S. that produces energy. And in fact, France, back in the mid-1970s, uh, made a bold move to transition from fossil fuel to nuclear energy. And a large percentage of their energy comes from nuclear uh, energy. There are drawbacks to that. We'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of weeks when we get to alternative energy sources. Hydropower, also very popular. Uh, the dam over in Las Vegas that I'm drawing, Hoover Dam, is it? I think it's Hoover Dam. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. Let me just Google that. Uh, Nevada. Yeah, Hoover Dam there is a great producer of energy. Think about it. It has potential energy and kinetic energy and that can be uh, used to distribute energy to the different sources. So if we look at the modern era today, we see that energy uh, consumption is, we said 90 percent was due to fossil fuel in the form of coal, gas, and oil. And from the 50s to late 1970s, energy consumption increased. Now, we talk about exajoules. I should talk about joules in terms of measurement. So let's take a look at the units of energy and something called the rate of energy use. The unit for energy is the joule. A joule is defined as a force of one newton per, uh, per every meter. Okay, requ uh, recall that we said work is force times a distance. So we know what force is defined as. So the joule itself is defined as a force of one newton per one meter. The rate of energy use is equal to power and the units there for power you see is in watts. So power is equal to the energy 
per unit time. So that's energy in joules divided by time in seconds. So we'll talk about rate of energy use on the next slide. It's a very practical real life type application that I'm thinking about creating a lab for you to work on from this. But you'll see in just a moment what I'm referring to. Now, we've used the term the, the unit of measure watt. A watt is one joule. Keep in mind we said that energy, the unit for energy is joule. So a watt has to do with energy divided by time. Because energy has the unit of joule, time has the unit of seconds. So when we talk about a watt, we're talking about one joule per second is equal to what we call power. Okay, And then we define something called hybrid energy unit called a watt hour. You're probably more familiar with the term kilowatt hour. Um, we see that one kilowatt hour is equal to 1,000 watts, which is equal to 3.6 megajoules. Mega meaning million. And from Wikipedia, you see here I've got a graph of the uh, SI units for joule. So when we talk about megajoule here, we're talking about 10 to the 6 joules, or 1 million joules. You'll also hear the term gigajoule, okay, which is 10 to the 9 joules. You might have heard of the term gigabyte. Well, when we're talking about energy itself, we're talking about gigajoules. And then what this particular chapter, you know, you go back here and it talks about energy consumption from the 1950s to the late 1970s. <clears throat> energy consumption increased from 30 exajoules to 75 exajoules. So an exajoule, you see here, is 10 to the 18th power, or you can think of it in terms of a billion billion joules. So a very large number. So when we talk about energy consumption in the US, it went from 30 million million joules, I'm sorry, 30 billion billion joules to 75 billion billion joules. So an increase of 45 billion billion joules in a 30 year period. Now, like I said, just take a moment to make sure that you understand uh, the unit for energy and how the joule is defined, the rate of energy use, which we call power, is equal to energy divided by time, one watt is equal to a joule per second, which gives us power, hybrid energy unit called watt hours, so one kilowatt hour is equal to a thousand watts, which is equal to 3.6 megajoules. So it's 3.6 megajoules of energy is equal to one kilowatt hour. Now you may be asking, why should I care? Well, we can actually use this to calculate the power usage and actually the cost of how much our energy is costing us to use on a daily, monthly, and annual day. So I found this off of the energysavings.com uh, website under energy consumption and it talks about figuring out your watts per day so to calculate energy consumption costs you simply multiply the units wattage so let's say you have a, um, a microwave microwave oven in your house most of us have those mine is a thousand watt unit and so, depending upon how many hours a day I use that, uh, in this particular example, they really don't identify what they're using, but they have some sort of appliance that is, uses 125 watts of power, and they use it three hours per day, and you end up with 375 watt hours per day. I wish they would have told us what this appliance was. Uh, I guess maybe a, a light bulb, right? A 100 watt light bulb, you could think maybe that's uh, so 125 watt light bulb. So in this particular case, it uses 375 watt hours per day. Now, typically, we see the term kilowatt hours, 
okay so to convert this to kilowatt hours they take the 375 and divide by a thousand because a thousand watts is equal to one kilowatt and so once you do that you end up with 0.35 or basically 0.4 kilowatt hours per day in that light bulb now you want to find out how much uh, power that you use you can simply take that 300 and, uh, that uh, 375 watt hours per day multiplied by 30 then divide by a thousand gives us 11.25 kilowatt hours per month so why do you care so it's using 11.25 kilowatt hours per month now you can figure out the cost so here is where you would need to go to like your electric bill or contact your electric company and say how much are you charging me kilowatt hours so in this particular example it's 0.10 or a dime per kilowatt hour is what this energy company is uh, costing to use their power or their energy so a dime per kilowatt hour multiply that by 11.25 kilowatt hours and that light bulb is costing about 1.13 dollars per month now this was on let's say a light uh, light bulb you can also use that on your um, microwave oven if you were to do that for instance here uh, let's see uh, I've got a thousand watt well, let's just let's just try to figure this because I'm kind of interested in how much this would cost for my microwave well, let's let's do a little number crunching here so I have a thousand watt a uh, thousand watt microwave multiply that by how many hours I use use it per day I don't use it that often let's see mainly at night for heating up leftovers and let's say oh maybe two minutes let's just say two and a half minutes per plate there's four family members in my house so that's what ten minutes per day so a thousand watts times ten minutes per day and now let's convert minutes to hour so there's what um, 60 minutes in one hour 60 minutes per one hour times 24 hours per day so let's see the days cancel out units actually it'll be easier if I write this down just bear with me I thought there was a way I could write this Ah, here we go. Thousand watts. And if I use it ten minutes per day, let's see watts times 10 minutes per day and I want to get it into kilowatt hours right is that what I'm doing here I want to get it into watt hours per day okay so there's 60 minutes in one hour so the minutes cancel out and let me get my calculator here on the side so it's a thousand times ten and then divide that by sixty 
So I come up with roughly 167 watt hours per day. Now we want to convert this watt hours to kilowatt hours. So I multiply that by a thousand watts. per one kilowatt. So I am down to roughly 0.17. So you see the watts cancel out here. So I'm left with kilowatt hours per day. Okay, now assuming that I cook at home every night for 30 days, which that's not reasonable, but let's say I have leftovers. So that's 15 days, and I'm actually using the microwave for my entire family. In one month. Because in the example, we wanted to get it into kilowatt hours per month. So now notice that, um, oh, actually, it should be 0. Point, sorry. In 15 days, it's 0. 0.5. So 15 may, let's see, days is a half a month. So let's do the math here. 0.17. Okay, the days go out. Let's cancel those out. Times 15 divided by 0.5 is equal to 5.1 kilowatt hours. per month. Okay, so let's find out how much that microwave is costing me per month. So if I go in here and I will take the 5.1 kilowatt hours It's 5.1 kilowatt hours per month. And I'm going to assume a 10 cent per kilowatt hour. I could find that out on my electric bill, but I don't have my electric bill in front of me as I'm doing this. So let's just assume a dime per kilowatt hour. Okay, my kilowatt hours go out, so I take the 5.1, multiply that by a dime. So roughly, it cost me 50 cents per month to use the microwave. Not a bad deal. So you could do this with different appliances in your house. And like I said, I'll probably have a lab where I have you go to your electric bill and pick an appliance and 
uh, figure out how much per month. So, okay. So, let's move on to energy consumption in the U.S. today. Since about 1980, we've increased our energy consumption by only about 25 billion billion joules or 25 exajoules. Notice that from the 1950s to the 1970s, a tw uh, or the late 1970s, a 30 year period, we went from 30 to 75 or a change of 45 exajoules. Since 1980, again a 30-year period, we've only increased by about 25 exajoules. So that tells us that the policies that we've put in place have helped to improve energy conservation. Uh, you see here through efficiency improvements. We also see that energy losses are associated with the production of electricity and transportation. So the efficiency or the efficient transfer of energy um, has improved. And you see there that our energy loss in 2011 was equal to energy use in 1965. So that gives us um, kind of something to compare it with there. Now let's take a look at a chart here from your textbook. On the y-axis you have exajoules. Again, let's go back when we're talking about units here. A joule is a unit for energy, so we're talking about energy here. And an exajoule is billion billion joules. So what we have here is the exajoules on the y-axis on the left side and then time here from 1980 all the way through 2035. This book came out roughly about 2010. So you see they have a line drawn there to basically denote that. So everything to the right of the line is future use and everything to the left of the line is historical use. So what you see here is that oil and other types of liquid, um, the usage there has been about 37 percent and again this is for the US, this particular slide here. And so you see here that back in 1980, uh, as we went through another energy crisis, oil, the consumption of oil, uh, or the oil being used for energy, began to dip into the mid-80s and then began to slightly increase for oils and other liquids. So that made up about 37% of our usage. And then if you look at coal, uh, you can see that roughly 21% of our energy comes from coal. Nuclear, 9%. Uh, natural gas, 25%. Liquid biofuels, 1%. And then renewable energy, about 7%. Now notice here that renewable energy dipped in the 1980s but has steadily been rising. Again, it just makes up about 7% as we hit 2010. And projected into the future, by 2035, it's projected that renewable energy, excluding the liquid biofuels, will make up about 11%. Notice here that basically oil and other liquids begin to flatten out. Coal slightly increases. Nuclear energy pretty much flattens out. So again, uh, nuclear energy, coal, and oil and other liquids over the next 25 years are projecting to flatten out. Liquid biofuels, natural gas, we're seeing a slight increase. So you see there was uh, liquid biofuels. And then renewable is showing the largest rate of change. So renewable energy, according to the projections, will be the type of energy that's being used in increasing numbers. So that's a good thing. We like renewable energy sources. If you look at the world and from 1986 to 2011 you see again this is an exajoules uh, oil uh, as of 2011 looks like it was about 175 exajoules or billion billion joules for the world if we go back to the U.S., 
just to kind of get an idea of 2011 here. Oil, it looks like, if I go across here, roughly about 30 exajoules. The world is 160 exajoules. So the U.S. used roughly 30 exajoules of energy compared to the rest of the world. You see here natural gas has increased. Uh, nuclear energy, renewables, and coal. Look at, look at coal. By the time uh, we got from 1986 to 2011, it increased from 300 exajoules to 500 exajoules. So coal has been really the, and actually I shouldn't say 500, the difference here, because these graphs are stacked on top of each other. So this is 350 coal here. So 150 exajoules by the time we hit 2011 on there. But you see coal has the greatest rate of change there. So we're going to look at the next few slides to get an idea of how energy has changed with time for the U.S., especially for a particular year. Um, we have always con imported considerably more oil than we produced. Um, however, that is changing. And we see that consumption is basically divided into three sectors, residential and commercial, so our homes and our businesses, the industrial and transportation areas. At the time this book was written or sent to press, uh, we see that uh, they were commenting that we're still vulnerable to changing world, world conditions affecting the production of oil. We've seen this lately. I mean, you look at how the price of oil, which at the time of this videotaping, which is March 19th, 2016, uh, a couple of weeks ago, oil had bottomed out at $27 twenty-seven dollars a barrel and that affected the stock market in fact the stock market over the first few months of 2016 had lost over 2,000 points now since then oil or the price of oil has increased to about forty dollars per barrel and our economy or the stock market I should say not necessarily the economy the stock market makes up one part of that has begun to rebound as well. So you see that not only the production and consumption of oil and bringing in oil from other countries is important for us, it also affects the economics of the U.S. as well. So let's take a look at uh, oil. And this is in millions of barrels per day. So 5 million barrels per day, 10, 15, 20, and 25. And then you see it goes back from the 1970s to the time that this book was written, 2010, and then projected out into the future uh, for the U.S. Now, something you should keep in mind, back in the early 1970s, from about 1972 through the early 80s, um, countries such as Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East uh, we got most of our oil from them and they had an embargo they stopped selling to us and then you see that um, our consumption though still increased and there was a lag of roughly a decade from 1970 to 1980 until our consumption dropped now our domestic supply through the early 70s and 80s began to decrease so what we actually can pull uh, from the U.S. has seen a general downward trend. So its highest trend was back in uh, probably 1972, which was roughly 12 million barrels per day, and down to a minimum, looks like about 2008, of about 8 million barrels per day. But notice it's increasing. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, earlier in this particular lecture we're beginning to find pockets of natural gas throughout the US in fact if we go back here 
We talked about oil from rocks, taking um, oil from rocks. So you see here shale oil or gas resources. So we're beginning to use this, although it is quite costly to pull uh, oil out of shale rocks. And actually there's a chemical process that actually converts it to usable oil. So in itself it's not oil as we think about it, but we can actually uh, change it into usable oil through different chemical processes. Okay, now let's take a look at our, this particular up here is our consumption and this is our domestic supply. So notice that as we went through the 70s and 80s our consumption increased and has continued to increase. Only recently since about the mid 2000s has it begun to decrease. Now this is what we can supply, the blue line this is what we consume, so the difference between these two is what we import. So if we look at this arrow here, which is roughly 1990, we were supplying domestically, at home, roughly 10 million barrels per day. However, we were consuming about 16 barrels, million barrels per day, which means we had to import 6 million barrels per day. Now look at what happened in the mid 2000s, around 2005, as our domestic supply began continued to decrease. Our consumption began to increase, it was still uh, increasing since the early 1990s, and so we had to basically import roughly 60 percent of our oil to meet consumption needs. And then, as we began to get to 2010, notice our consumption of oil has begun to decrease. Our domestic supply is beginning to increase. That's great. We want to close this gap. We want to reach energy independence. And to do that, it will take many different um, uh, things to come together, which we'll talk about here toward the end of this lecture in terms of al alternative energy resources. But projected out to about 2035, it looks like there's only a 36% gap between consumption and domestic supply, which basically means we'll be providing about two-thirds of our oil domestically. Of course, that is projections. Now let's talk about energy conservation, because notice right here that since the mid-2000s, our consumption has, of oil has begun to decrease and part of that has to do with energy conservation, the increased efficiency of our energy, and a very interesting process called cogeneration. Co well, you remember in when we're talking about conserving energy, part of that has to do with using less energy. Obviously, that means turning lights off in rooms that you're not using, taking bicycles to, to work or to school if feasible. There are many, many ways to conserve energy and basically adjusting our needs and uses to minimize the amount of high quality energy that we need for a given task. Now with increased energy efficiency, we can design equipment to get more energy output from a given amount of input energy. Remember the first law of efficiency? Let's go back just a moment to first law of efficiency. So that, again, talks about the amount of energy available to us without any consideration of the quality or the availability. So how much energy we use without the quality or availability of the energy. But conservation can actually help in that area. So we design, construct, and build better equipment to get more energy out of what we're putting in. And then for second law efficiency, better matches between the energy source and the end use. I'll go back to that example in your textbook. It's great. It's talking about lighting a candle. We can use a match, low energy, to actually uh, light the candle, or we can use a blowtorch. Both light the candles, but the blowtorch is using a lot of energy 
a lot of that energy is being wasted in trying to reach its end, which is to light the candle. Now let's talk a little bit about cogeneration. I find this really fascinating. It's basically, as we're going through, recall that I'm going to go back here, see if I can find this. So we talked about examples of first and second law efficiencies, and we talk about the incandescent light bulb. It's, it's about 5% efficient in terms of first law efficiency. And the rest of the energy, about 95% of the energy, is waste energy or energy given off to the environment in terms of heat. So when we talk about an incandescent light bulb, only about f we can only get about 5% energy out of that, and the other 95% is lost. When we talk about cogeneration, we talk about also using part of this 95% of waste and using that as usable energy. And that's actually being done. So let's take a look at that. So, for instance, capture waste heat increases overall efficiency in a power plant from 33 to 75% efficiency. That's incredible. It's more than double the efficiency there. And in fact, the estimates is, is that this waste heat could provide 10% of the power capacity of the U.S. Now, I know 10% doesn't sound like a lot, but anything that we can get out of that wasted heat energy is good because that means we don't have to depend on other sources of energy. We talk about building design. We see a lot of that. You know, you talk about the West Coast, and they deal with earthquakes and those types of situations. Uh, they talk about building design to maximize structural integrity uh, against uh, earthquakes. Well, we also look at building design in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, there are these companies, I think it's called LEED, uh, let's see, LEED certification. And this is really interesting. Um, we've got buildings on the state of Iowa, uh, Iowa State campus that are what we call LEED certified. Okay, and so what we mean by LEED is very energy efficient. And I'm just trying to find something simple to explain what I mean here. They call these green buildings. I think I'm right back at the... Um, so again, it talks about energy efficiency, uh, the importance uh, for buildings. They use high energy efficiency infrastructure such as street lighting, LED traffic signals. But basically these buildings that are being constructed are being constructed with the idea of being as efficient as it can be. Uh, for instance, to take you uh, to take advantage of solar energy. If we look at older homes, you've probably done this in your own home. I've done this on my own home. In other words, I've got an existing building, my home, that was built in 1978. So probably not very efficient uh, from an energy standpoint. I know it's not because I've had to do some caulking. I've had to put up some visqueen on windows to prevent um, air, uh, environmental air from outside coming in and the heating of the air inside the house leaving. So building design is a way that we can increase the efficiency of our energy. In the industry, uh, you see here that basically industry consumes about a third of the energy produced. That's quite a bit. And now most in industries are using cogeneration. In other words, taking that lost heat energy and using it for energy. Automobile design. You see here, U.S. automobile back in the early 70s, 14 miles per gallon. And it, by the way, the U.S. is lagging in miles per gallon uh, compared to the other parts of the world. It's, it's kind of sad, but 
Uh, there, if you look at over in some of the Asian countries like Japan and China, uh, their cars are getting 30, 40, 50 miles to the gallon. Uh, but we are lagging. But from the 70s to the, uh, the mid-90s, you see here we've increased or doubled uh, miles per gallon. During the late 90s, consumption rates did not improve much. So we continue to consume fuel at a high rate. 2004, you see here SUVs are popular, and yes, I'm guilty of that as well. My wife has an SUV. We use that to transport the kids around, but they're not very fuel efficient. In fact, I bought a car myself back in 2011. I won't say what kind it is, but I'm only getting about 19 to 20 miles to gallon. So just not uh, very efficient in terms of energy being used. Now, there are some of you out there that actually have hybrid cars. And you see here, 90 to uh, 60 to 90 miles per gallon, 90 out on the highway, 60 in the city. And we talked about in this slide here that we're beginning to decrease the amount of oil consumed from the mid 2000s to 2010. Part of that has to do with people using hybrid cars. Okay. So that's one thing I talked about, increased efficiency and resulting conservation of fuel, cars that are smaller, engines constructed of lighter materials, combination of fuel burning engine and electric motor. Uh, we know that plug-in hybrids are now available. I think it's Chrysler that has one, an electrical car like that. This particular uh, schematic here shows what would be considered the optimal car in terms of energy consumption. You notice it's lightweight framing, so there's not as much friction, not as much weight, which would lead to a decrease in fuel consumed or actually increase the miles per gallon. You still have the ICE, the internal combustion engine, but you also have an electric motor and you have electricity to power the, uh, the air conditioning, fans, etc. Uh, you have the electrical car here that you can charge uh, you've got lithium ion or lead uh, acid battery packs. These are all the things that we're seeing in the car industry that's helping to take a bite out of our consumption of oil. Now, anytime we're talking about anything in the environment, we're dealing with values, choices, and in this particular chapter, energy conservations. The UN has developed an index. It's called the Index of Human Development, HDI. This varies from about 0.3 all the way up to 0.9. So it's, we're looking at this index from 0 to 1. And this index gives us the relationship between human development, in other words, a measure of life expectancy. We talked about that in the population chapter a few weeks ago. Education and wealth and use of energy per person. So we're talking about okay, quality of life and the associated use of energy per person. Okay, quality of life and use of energy per person. Let's take a look at this slide. This is very interesting. So you see here on the left side of the graph is the Human Development Index goes from zero up to, that should be 1.0, not 10, but 0 to 1. And then it's energy use in kilowatt hours per person. Okay, and then the HDI, low, medium, and high index. You'll notice immediately uh, the continent of Africa, Ethiopia, and Congo. Uh, the HDI, the Human Development Index, is very low quality of life and, ener and energy consumption is low for uh, the continent of Africa. You see here that virtually very little energy, if you look at kilowatt per hours, is being used per person in Ethiopia, Congo, uh, Pakistan. By the time you get to Pakistan, you see now the kilowatt hours per person is roughly 500 and the quality the human development index you see is beginning to increase and what you notice if we look at the blue line 
is the HDI, quality of life, and the energy usage per person is increasing. So there seems to be a correlation there between energy use per person and the Human Development Index. Now when I first looked at this particular chart I thought it was kind of interesting because the first place I looked was down here seeing uh, who was not using very much energy and their quality of life. And then I looked at the US and I see that the US per person each one of us, you and I, roughly use oh, 13,000 kilowatts per person in the US and our quality of life index is about a point nine. Now look here, look at Australia, look at Japan, France, Germany, um, the UK, Italy, Spain, all have the same quality of life, but they use much less energy. To me, they're being very efficient. They're still maintaining a high quality of life, a high standard of life, but at the same time, using much less energy. For instance, Great Britain, roughly about 5,700 kilowatt, um, kilowatt hours per person. And then you go to the US, we only have a slight bump in quality of life, but we more than double the amount of energy that we use. Look at Canada. Canada actually has a slightly uh, lower HDI, but their average energy usage is almost 16,000 kilowatt hours per person. So really, where you want to be is somewhere in this area here. So we see some of the um, European countries. Uh, we see Japan. Uh, we see South Korea here being very efficient with the energy that they use and still maintaining a high quality of life. You look at China. They're not using very much energy per person, but they have a slightly lower standard of living. Mexico, again, has a slightly better than China and using about the same energy kilowatt hours per person. So I thought this was really interesting. Again, this HDI is the relationship between human development and use of energy per person. I look out here in the U.S. and Canada and even Australia to a certain degree and I see we're being very inefficient uh, with our energy use per person. So. I think it's obviously uh, the U.S. and Canada could do much better in modifying their behavior to help conserve energy. Here are some examples that you see. I talked about that earlier, biking, carpools, hybrid cars, turning off lights, shorter showers, uh, the thermostat, um, energy efficient compact fluorescent light bulbs. My wife and I have been using that for several years now, so that part we've done and purchasing energy efficient appliances. My wife and I just recently um, purchased an HVAC system that is considered very efficient in terms of efficiency, energy efficiency. More ways there to conserve energy. Now you may not think this makes a huge difference but every little bit certainly does help um, and also helps your your bottom dollar as well. You see there ceiling drafts, insulating your home, uh, washing clothes in cold water, purchasing local foods to reduce energy and transporting foods. Now here in Iowa, especially in the winter, it's a bit of a challenge because we like to have fruit year-round and that's not possible with our winters. And so we import uh, quite a bit of fruit from Florida and from California. There are transportation costs with that. Uh, the trucks that are bringing it are uh, consuming fossil fuel. And so that's, that's, uh, that's a trade-off. Um, people want their fruit. Power strips, turning them on and off, and installing solar water heaters or collectors. Now let's talk a bit about the energy policy. There is a verbiage that is used called the business as usual approach. Business as usual. In other words, just continuing our current consumption, our current habits, not cutting back. 
because we're going to assume that we will be able to find more fossil fuel, that we will be able to build larger power plants, uh, so we can just continue to use energy as freely as we always have. This requires no new innovative thinking. It requires no change in our political landscape, economics, or social conditions. And it also assumes no reduction in oil production. Now, there are energy sources that are not renewable, oil being one. We talked about that earlier in this lecture. Once the oil and the coal runs out, that's it. It's done. And so this business as usual approach uh, is, can be a bit dangerous in my opinion uh, because we will end up using all of our fossil fuels down the road, maybe 100, 150 years. Our great grandchildren will begin to, to feel the effects of that. Um, so I think you know, you, you look back at the early 70s and the 80s when these conservation movements began to, to uh, come up. Um, I think we're heading in the right direction because it's going to be a combination of renewable and non-renewable energy sources that I think will help us as we go forward. There is this policy called the Lovins Energy Policy. And it states that sustainable alternative energy policy will have the following characteristics. So if you're going to look at sustainable alternative energy, um, it relies heavily on renewable energy resources, diverse and tailored for maximum effectiveness, in other words, very efficient, flexible, accessible, and understandable to most people, and it's matched in energy quality, geographic distribution, and scale to end use needs. So matched in energy quality, uh, quality, we're talking about second law efficiencies. Now, you have this business as usual approach, and you have this Lovins energy policy. Uh, I think we need to meet somewhere in the middle between the renewable and non-renewable energy resources. So if we're looking at energy into the future, uh, we're going to have to change our patterns of energy use. And part of that change will be population densities. Uh, we'll have to have intensive conservation measures. We saw from the chapter on population dynamics that we're continuing to increase the population. The recent change in policy in China, moving from one child per family to two children per family, will also um, continue to pull on our resources. And by 2050, energy consumption of U.S. may be 160 billion billion joules. So if we go back to that graph here, and we look at 2010 energy consumption, uh, we're talking, to, did that say U.S. or world? Hold on just a moment. Okay, cons U.S. consumption of energy. So we'll go back to this particular chart here. In 2010, um, you see here in terms of exajoules, we're roughly at 100 exajoules, 100, 100, 100 billion billion joules, quite a bit of energy. And what your textbook is saying is that within the next 40 years, we'll increase that to 60 ex, uh, 160 exajoules. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the energy source going to be? Will we do this business as usual or turn to alternative sources? There's always that uh, give and take, that push and pull between those that want to do a business as usual and those that want to look at alternative resources. Again, I think it's going to be um, a negotiation is going to have to be an agreement somewhere in between that. So for the 21st century energy policy, the idea is to promote conventional energy sources but reduce our reliance on foreign sources and we're seeing that even today. We need to encourage alternative energy here in Iowa 
Wind is a huge uh, source of energy. Uh, hydrogen and biofuels in the uh, southwestern portion of the U.S. Geothermal, uh, geothermal heating and cooling is being used in houses out there. Solar panels, again, have been used as far back as the 70s, 1970s. But again, all of these alternative energy resources cannot currently meet the demand for our uh, current appetite for energy. We still rely on fossil fuels as well. We're going to have to provide for energy infrastructures, uh, promote conservation measures, increase our efficiency standards, less waste energy, tax credits. Well, you talk about motivate people to conserve energy, offer them tax credits, that will certainly uh, uh, be a big incentive for uh, people out there. And then we have to look at the pros and cons of nuclear power. Now, since the 1970s, I think I mentioned this earlier, France gets most of their energy from nuclear uh, power. But I was reading somewhere, and I wish I could think where I read this. It, it might even be in your textbook. It talks about to supply the current energy. If we went away completely from fossil fuel and all other forms of alternative energy, and we relied uh, co completely on nuclear power, uh, we would see nuclear power plants... Um, quite a few. I cannot remember how many in each state, but I remember lo uh, looking at the number and just being amazed. So, you know, maybe every 50 miles you have a nuclear power plant. I, I don't think people are ready for that. Um, just my opinion there. That's why I think it's going to take an integrated approach to solving our energy needs. And what we mean by this integrated sustainable energy approach is that no single energy source, uh, not just relying on nuclear power alone or fossil fuels or other forms of alternative energy, we're going to have to look at a range of options such as fossil fuels, alternative energy, uh, renewable resources of, or renewable sources of energy. The goal here for an integrated sustainable energy management is to move towards sustainable energy development and also implemented at the local level. It would look something like providing reliable sources of energy, not causing damage or uh, minimizing the damage to our environment on the global, regional, and local uh, environments, and help to ensure that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will inherit a quality environment with a fair share of the Earth's resources. So, any plan or plans that are developed should provide for sustainable energy development, uh, aggressive energy efficiency, notice it says aggressive energy efficiency and conservation, and then provide for the diversity and integration of energy sources. Again, it's not going to be one or two areas of energy that's going to provide all of our uh, energy um, that we need. And then also there needs to be a fair balance between economic health and environmental quality. Our politicians can't seem to agree on that. They're going to have to agree on that um, if we're going to move forward. And then using second law efficiencies as an energy policy tool. The global pattern of increasing energy consumption led by our country it simply cannot be sustained without looking at a new paradigm. And this means we'll have to change our values to a certain degree. Um, one of the things that energy policies are built upon are these breakthroughs in technology that will cost us very little. That's not necessarily going to be um, anytime soon. So some examples there that what we can do is fuel efficient automobiles and living in more energy efficient homes. Again, there are steps that you can take to make your existing home efficient. Okay, this was an introductory to energy. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll get into other forms of energy, renewable, uh, nuclear, 
uh, it'll be interesting as we go through the next week. Uh, to, so to summarize, uh, the first law of thermodynamics means we cannot create or destroy energy. It's just transformed from one form to another. We talked about potential energy uh, changing into kinetic energy and going back from kinetic to potential energy. We talked about potential energy of, let's say, a match. Once you strike the match, you change that potential energy to chemical energy. The energy in our bodies, when we do work, in other words, force times the distance, we exert a force over a distance, requires chemical energy within our bodies to do this. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that as energy is used, it goes from a more usable to a less usable form. However, like we said, uh, with this um, concept, I'll show you back right here. Cogeneration, we can take some of that less useful form of energy and convert it into energy that we can use. So that gives you an idea there. We talked about the two types of energy efficiency, the first law and the second law. Um, basically, we have a high potential for saving energy through better matching of the quality of energy sources with their end uses. Again, I'll just go back to that match and the blowtorch. Uh, when you want to light a candle, you would, you would want to use an energy source such as a match instead of a blowtorch, which wastes a lot of energy. Energy conservation and improvements in the energy efficiency can have significant effects on our consumption. We saw that back here uh, from 2005 to 2010. Uh, we began to uh, decrease our consumption of oil in terms of millions of barrels per day uh, by enacting some of these conservation efforts and also renewable energy resources as well. Uh, which way are we going to go? Or are we going to go down the business as usual path? Uh, basically just continuing to use energy and the sources of energy that we always have used. We've relied heavily, heavily on fossil fuels. We've done some uh, investigation into renewable resources of energy, alternative energy. Uh, but again, um, do we want to go along that path? or look at alternative energy sources that will provide sources that are renewable, they're diverse, flexible, and they are a better match um, between energy quality and end use. In other words, the second law efficiencies. We know that the transition from fossil fuels to other energy sources requires a plan, an integrated energy management plan. This will help provide reliable sources of energy that minimize harm to the environment. They also, more importantly, ensure that our future generations will not only have energy, but also a quality environment. Now, we talk about the U.S. We are approaching energy independence. Um, we have found the new sources of oil and natural gas. Uh, increased possibility of additional environmental consequences, though, is the drawback to that. Again, this is something we'll have to keep in mind as we go forward.